Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Please take your seats and welcome the president of the American Epilepsy Society, Dr. Douglas Coulter. Well, thank you, everyone. I'm, I'm delighted to welcome you to the 19th Judith Hoyer Lecture in Epilepsy, Contemporary Care for Women with Epilepsy, Progress from the Past. The Judith Hoyer Lecture in Epilepsy combines the discussion of the state of the art in a specific area of epilepsy and the impact it may have on healthcare delivery. We are proud to partner with the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke in presenting this annual session. Our goal is that this lecture be accessible to both professional and public audiences. To that end, for the fifth year, we are streaming a live webcast of this public lecture, so many more may listen live or to the archived recording afterwards. I also want to acknowledge the support of educational grants from Upshur Smith, ASI, I'm sorry, that went right past the, uh, can you go back? No? Okay. Commercial support. The live stream of the lecture is supported by Greenwich Biosciences, a partner of Jazz Pharmaceuticals. The Hoyer Lecture is supported by educational grants from Upshur Smith, ASI, and Prasco. The AES Extraordinary Contributions Award is designated for those who have made exceptional contributions across multiple fronts, including science, education, leadership, and advocacy. This award is only presented when the Board of Directors determines there is a candidate whose accomplishments embody the spirit of the recognition. Please join me in congratulating Gardner Lapham, RN, MPH, for receiving the 2021 Extraordinary Contributions Award. Gardner Lapman is a passionate epilepsy advocate. After losing her four-year-old son to SUDEP, Gardner became actively involved in the epilepsy community. She is former board chair of the Citizens United for Research in Epilepsy, now Cure Epilepsy, and a co-founder and current chair of Partners Against Mortality and Epilepsy. Gardner also cares deeply about narrowing the epilepsy treatment gap in low-income countries, especially Africa. She currently serves on the International League Against Epilepsy's Global Outreach Task Force. Gardner is a trustee of the BAND Foundation, which supports SUDEP prevention and education work, as well as efforts to reduce the treatment gap in low-income countries. Gardner has served as a health care policy advisor for the humanitarian organization CARE, as an emergency room nurse at Atlanta's Grady Memorial Hospital, and as a trustee of the Washington Free Clinic and Whitman Walker Health. She lives in Washington, D.C. with her husband and three children. Gardner, please join me at the podium to receive your award. I'm so delighted you're getting this. I couldn't. Thank you, Dr. Coulter, and thank you, the American Epilepsy Society. I'm deeply humbled by this award. It's impossible to overstate what this community has meant to me, both at the um, immediacy of Henry's death and until this day. This community has helped me to confront my grief and turn it into positive action. First and foremost, I'm grateful to the other parents I met after Henry died. They understood my loss, welcomed me into this grim club, and showed me how to have a voice and why it matters. I'm especially grateful to Susan Axelrod and Jean Donnelty, who were my lifelines in those early days, and to Cure, which was my second home. And then there are all the people living with epilepsy who've taught me so much about resilience and hope. Lately, I've been focused on the staggering epilepsy treatment gap in poorer countries and especially in Africa, where up to 80% of people with epilepsy receive no treatment. And, and just to say, $5 a year could treat someone with epilepsy. Hearing their stories of stigma, shame, social isolation, 
and even abuse is breathtaking. Yet I've been equally astonished by the power of advocates in Africa. They are telling their stories and reshaping the conversation around epilepsy to build understanding, expand treatment, and improve policy. While we have a long way to go to narrow this treatment gap, I know we'll get there because of these advocates who risk so much choosing to be on the front lines of change. I hope we can all find ways to join them and bolster global, global efforts to improve epilepsy care. Finally, I'm grateful for the AES community. I've been overwhelmed by the willingness of so many researchers and providers to collaborate with people with epilepsy and their families to advance solutions. This openness and desire to learn from families takes humility. It also demonstrates compassion and a sincere commitment to improve individual lives. I'm especially grateful to the AES board for embracing the PAMI Collaborative and for seeing in it an opportunity to work side by side with families to one day end premature epilepsy mortality. In accepting this award, I feel like I'm doing so on behalf of all families impacted by epilepsy. By recognizing me, I believe AES is really recognizing people who live with epilepsy, as well as those who suffered an unimaginable loss. They are celebrating the actions, both big and small, that we all take in shaping the response to this challenging disease. Thank you very much for this honor, but more importantly, thank you for inviting me into your community and working with me and so many other families to end epilepsy as we know it. The Distinguished Service Award was established in 1993 and recognizes outstanding service by an AES member in the field of epilepsy with a special emphasis on exemplary contributions in service to the American Epilepsy Society, its members, and our patients. I am most pleased to present the 2021 AES Distinguished Service Award to David M. Labiner. Dr. David M. Labiner is professor and chair of the Department of Neurology, professor of nurse neurosurgery at the University of Arizona College of Medicine and a professor of pharmacy practice and science at the University of Arizona College of Pharmacy, divisions of the University of Arizona Health Sciences Center in Tucson. He has served as president of the National Association of Epilepsy Centers, as well as on the board of directors of the American Epilepsy Society, Epilepsy Foundation of America, and the Epilepsy Foundation of Arizona. He also served on the board of directors of the University Medical Center, Tucson, and the board of the University of Arizona Health Network. In addition to authoring or co-authoring over 100 peer-reviewed articles, Dr. Labiner has maintained a research program funded over 15 years by the CDC. While president of the NAEC, he led the effort to develop an accreditation system for epilepsy centers in the United States. In his roles on the aforementioned boards, he has been active in advocacy for a public health effort to support individuals with epilepsy and their families. Dr. Labiner, please join me at the podium to receive this well-deserved honor with our deepest thanks for your service. Well-deserved, well-deserved. Thank you very much to the AES Awards Committee for bestowing this um, tremendous honor upon me. Uh, I first want to acknowledge my wife, Jan, who uh, chose to spend the week in Arizona rather than to come to Chicago in December, uh, because she has been along my side and been a parent in absentia for a long time while I did service for our society. Uh, my daughter, Kate, who is an epileptologist in Texas, uh, who uh, is also now involved in our society, and my daughter, Betsy, who uh, proofread the materials that got submitted on my behalf. My parents, who uh, showed me many years ago the importance of service to others. And then, now into our own ranks, uh, a thank you to Tim Pedley, and, uh, a former president of the AES, and Alan Hauser, who got me to go to the uh, American Epilepsy Society meeting when it was still at the Roosevelt Hotel in New York. Uh, Jim Wilmore, who gave me a call one day and summoned me to get more involved, and uh, it was really him who was the impetus that got me uh, tremendously involved. To all of my colleagues on various committees, 
and importantly to my colleagues at the University of Arizona who carried on the work every day while I was doing something for the society and other organizations. Um, to Ed Hogan, who nominated me, thank you. Uh, to Jim Wilmore and Eleanor ben Menachem for supporting the nomination, thank you. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge uh, my oldest late childhood friend who had a seizure beside me in the lunchroom uh, when we were in middle school. And I always wonder if that's not what got me started in this, in this field. I've spent my whole career looking to help improve the quality of life of people with epilepsy. I'm hoping this is not a valedictory, but rather uh, just a, a passage along the way in what I hope will be many years of continued service. So thank you very much for this honor. I really appreciate it. Thank you, David, and congratulations. Core to the AES mission is the development of the next generation of basic, translational, and clinical investigators. These young investigators are the future of our community, and they are a vital part of our society. AES encourages young investigators to attend the annual meeting by providing travel and other awards in recognition of the most outstanding abstract submissions. You can see the listing of these early career investigators in the award book, and I encourage you to visit their posters. In addition, AES supports research through more than $1 million in fellowship and grant awards. An example of the partnership to ensure funding for early career investigators is the AES American Brain Foundation, AAN, Epilepsy Foundation, Susan S. Spencer Clinical Research Training Scholarship in Epilepsy. Please join me in recognizing Dr. Dennis Spencer, who will introduce the 2020, 2021 awardee, Dr. Colin Ellis from the University of Pennsylvania. Dennis. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. Um, Dr. Colin Ellis is an assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania and the recipient, as Dr. Coulter said, of the 2021 Susan Spencer Clinical Research and Training Scholarship. In his two years that he'll be spending in this fellowship, he'll be studying polygenic risk transmission in familial epilepsies. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Ellis on this prestigious award. The Susan S. Spencer Clinical Research Fellowship is made possible by generous personal gifts of AES members and others who have made contributions to the endowment that supports this fellowship. Thanks to all of you who have been part of this effort and for everyone here, just a reminder that it only takes a minute to support the Susan Spencer Fund and other AES research efforts and educational programs. In fact, if you take out your phone right now and text AES to the number you see on the screen, you'll be on your way to helping AES build epilepsy talent pipeline. Um, yeah, I, as, as everybody knows, I'm shameless in my request for money from everybody. Uh, in fact, there are many individuals who have been asking about the seahorse pins and when they were going to reappear. Uh, the, C the AES has made more of these seahorse pins. Uh, and just to remind you a bit of what, the, what this is about, this seahorse pin was uh, modeled after a, a seahorse pin that uh, Susan wore. And <clears throat> the seahorse itself is uh, silver and gold. It has a carved heart in the center. Um, and through that carving, you see a platinum electrode contact that's been collected over a 30-year period from our operating room in, of intracranial electrodes. So you may uh, now go to the, the um, membership table just across from the reception, and if you'll give pledge $1,000 a year for three years, you can be the happy recipient of one of these. And remember <clears throat> that it's going to make a great holiday gift great Christmas gift, uh, and besides the gift, of course, you're supporting AES and all of its, uh, its funds. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dennis, and congratulations, Dr. Ellis, on this recognition for your research efforts. 
The AES is also proud to be the administrative home, as well as a member of the Epilepsy Leadership Council. To say a few words about the ELC, I would like to invite Amy Brin, MSN, MA, PCNS, BC, Chair of the ELC Steering Committee, to come to the podium. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Dr. Coulter. I'm happy to be here on behalf of the ELC. The Epilepsy Leadership Council is made up of professional societies, nonprofit patient advocacy organizations, and federal agencies all working together to expand our impact and improve the lives of individuals living with epilepsy. The slides you saw when you entered the hall today showed some of the important research and support services that our members um, provide throughout the year to our shared community. We've heard about several new exciting research partnerships that groups within ELC have established as well. I encourage you to visit their tables in the nonprofit section of the exhibit hall to hear more about their important work they're doing to support our shared epilepsy community. And I look forward to our continued collaboration and commitment to improving the lives of people affected with epilepsy. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, and to the steering committee for your leadership of ELC. I am now pleased to introduce Dr. Walter Korschitz, director of the NINDS. Dr. Korschitz's presence reflects both the long history of strong NINDS support for the epilepsy community, as well as his personal commitment to epilepsy research. We sincerely appreciate his taking time from a very busy schedule to be here with us again this year. Thank you, Walter. Well, you don't have to thank me. This is the best thing I've done in two years. <laughs> Um, yes, so um, NINDS is pleased to sponsor this 19th annual Judith Hoyer Lecture on Epilepsy. It's a lecture intended for the public and the research uh, communities together. Um, the purpose is to highlight progress and encourage future progress um, towards a cure for epilepsy. Uh, it is named in memory of Ms. Judith Hoyer. Um, she was a board member of the Epilepsy Foundation and the wife of Representative Steny Hoyer, who we will hear from shortly. She spent her life dedicated to improving access for children to education and for improving uh, the quality of life and supporting research for those who suffer with epilepsy. Next slide. Uh, next slide. So I'm gonna just um, talk to you a little bit about, um, from the viewpoint of NIH, what's been going on the last two years in epilepsy. And, and I think the main take home point is that science is progressing. It, has, it hasn't stopped. Nothing stopped the investigators. Um, so I'm from the Neurologic Institute, and we invest across the spectrum of basic to clinical research. We try and identify gaps in research, train the talented workforce, develop new tools, um, or will support others to develop new tools and then communicate and collaborate with stakeholders such as yourselves. Next slide. So COVID is certainly the, um, the, the discussion point uh, at all meetings. Um, um, and from our point of view, uh, we've been looking carefully at the ev effects of COVID on the brain. Um, thank goodness it does not seem to cause a severe encephalitis or meningitis. Um, but it does cause uh, blood-brain barrier breakdowns, a small vessel disorder, because we believe that it's related to the fact that the virus attaches to the ACE2 receptors in the endothelial cells, uh, and in the brain they are, they are abundant. Um, so what's seen is breakdown of blood-brain barrier with inflammatory processes that come in after it. Next slide. And this is in the acute, these are slide, slides from people, people who have died from COVID. Next slide. Um, and, and as you probably know better than I, um, that the really sick people who go into intensive care units with COVID have serious neurologic disability, delirium, coma, um, and, and seizures, uh, particularly if they have had some kind of a brain injury or a history of epilepsy in the past. Uh, next slide. 
But um, the other, so I've been working with a bunch of different teams trying to develop vaccines, do new medicines uh, to uh, improve the recovery after acute COVID, prevent people from getting in the hospital with COVID. Uh, NIH is a really ambitious, multi, uh, multi center, multi, all over the world series of trials trying to understand what medicines are best to treat folks. Um, but right now, a lot of the attention is moving to the people who had suffered from COVID and are still having persistent symptoms. And initially, we thought this was going to be common in people who were in the intensive care units. Uh, but it turns out that it's actually not uncommon in people who are never even in the hospital. So there are now millions of people who have had COVID and have persistent symptoms. And they, they have a variety of symptoms, but the, the neurologic ones are actually the most disabling. Uh, trouble with concentration, sleep, pain, um, it's really severe fatigue. Uh, and so we have a program called the Recover Program that's going to recruit tens of thousands of people to try and understand what's the basis for this condition. Um, and then also to set up um, studies that can go on for years based on electronic health record data to see if having COVID predisposes you to something in, in the future, um, potentially epilepsy or dementia, uh, stroke or heart disease, diabetes, because all the organs in the body that I, uh, are affected by COVID. Next slide. If we go to the outlook for NIH funding, uh, we are currently operating under what's called the continuing resolution. So that means the funding that we've had before continues, we think. Um, but we don't know until the a budget is uh, passed by the Congress. And the last we heard yesterday is that this probably will not come until uh, mid-February. Um, but the president's budget, the House budget, has a significant increase for NINDS and the associated programs, particularly the Brain Initiative, 21st Century Cures money is for Brain Initiative money. So that program is, is really fantastic. And, and as I've said before, that program is focused solely on understanding circuits in the brain and treating their disorders. And so epilepsy being you know, a classic circuit disorder, is at the focus of much of their brain research, particularly the clinical research that goes on in patients who volunteer for studies when they're undergoing epilepsy monitoring. We also have considerable funding now for pain research, um, and that's part of what's called the HEAL initiative, which is helping to end addiction long term. And there's other funding coming, uh, 43 million for pain research is in the president's budget for NINDS. So that area of, of research will really be stimulated. Next slide. Should those funds come through? Next slide. Um, for for epilepsy research, uh, the, as you can see, the funding's been going up steadily. It's now at about $198 million a year. And still, as for all our diseases, it's not really enough. Um, uh, next slide. Um, but we have made a lot of progress, and, and, and we, meaning you and us, together, uh, particularly in the Curing Epilepsies Conference and in the development of the benchmarks, which AES has, has really uh, pioneered along with our NIH staff. Um, and so the revised benchmarks are, are now out, and you can actually see the sessions on the videocast. Next slide. And. Um, you know, the, the main areas are to understand the causes of the epilepsies, to try and prevent them, developing preventive treatments, improve the treatment option, options for controlling seizures while limiting side effects, and then a focus on preventing and managing the co-occurring conditions in people with epilepsy. So this is kind of a, these are the main items, but there's a lot of specifics here to guide the research going forward. Next slide. There's also been a number of workshops um, in the, during the COVID period, a joint CDC and NIH webinar on health services research in the epilepsies, and another one on post-traumatic epilepsy on models developing standardized common data elements and optimization of research in post-traumatic epilepsy. Um, so the, everything's been on Zoom, but it's surprisingly how well it's worked so far. Um, certainly not as good in, as being in person, um, but a lot of progress has been made. Next slide. And um, we're especially proud of the work going on, the Epilepsy Centers Without Walls. Uh, we have three of them ongoing still, 
And um, they, their success has really changed our thinking at NIH, and we're thinking about bringing what's happened in epilepsy to many of the other disorders, this kind of team approach to solve problems um, that are, you know, doable within a certain time frame uh, really galvanizes people um, to, to move the field. Next slide. We also want, I wanted to mention that we continue the epilepsy therapy screening program, currently University of Utah, where people can bring in their assets, drugs, and test them in a series of models. This is all free, and, and it's actually been very important in bringing a number of uh, drugs to market over the years. Next slide. And a couple of, you know, advances to just to mention, um, our staff pulled out a couple of papers, and this one um, is uh, from Long John Woo's lab at Mayo Clinic with uh, uh, a Upkong Io, who's now at University of Virginia, uh, looking at microglia and how they interact with uh, the dendrites uh, in an epilepsy model. So there's been a lot of work in this space before. We see the microglia atta attaching to the uh, processes, never was really clear what they are doing. Uh, in this study, they find that they find these pouches of the microglia connected to the dendrites, and that actually seems to protect the dendrites and help them uh, recover from the excessive excitation. Uh, but the, immuno the immunology is, is complicated. There's the yin and the yang. And the next slide is a study from Gene Paz at the uh, University of California, San Francisco, looking at the role of complement factor C1Q. Again, it's released from the microglia, and it a activates um, uh, synaptic pruning, and in this instance, it's been seen in the activation of the thalamus um, due to cortical traumatic brain injury. So no injuries necessary to the thalamus, but the connections um, and, and hyper excitation of the thalamus leads to the C1Q expression and then to uh, actual seizure activity um, in a mouse model. So. Um, and this kind of pathway is being um, studied in multiple different conditions to uh, modulate it for, uh, to protect neurons. Um, so really interesting work going on, young people coming to the field. Um, so I think epilepsy is in, in really good shape going forward. Next slide. We have a number of ongoing trials um, preventing epilepsy using the Vigabitrin trial, Martina Babin at University of Alabama, and the dietary treatment for the rare glucose transporter type 1 deficiency, Juan Pascual at University of Texas, the PI. And then the maternal outcomes and neurodevelopment effects of antileptic drugs by Kim Meter at Stanford and Paige Pinnell at University of Pittsburgh. Uh, next slide. And speaking of Paige Pinnell, um, she has uh, been selected as the Hoyer lecturer and uh, really looking forward to, um, to her talk. Um, she's now the Henry Higman Professor of Neurology and Chair of the Department of Neurology at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, as you all know, she's an acclaimed uh, clinician investigator focusing on sex-specific outcomes in epilepsy, hormones on seizures, and epilepsy during pregnancy. Uh, she served as the president of AES and the board of directors of the Epilepsy Foundation, and she's a well-known leader in our field. So congratulations to Paige. And to introduce Paige, I'd like to introduce um, our uh, majority leader uh, and congressman from Maryland, uh, Steny Hoyer. Next slide. Uh, Rep Representative Steny Hoyer has been our fifth congressional district leader uh, since 1981. He's the House Majority Leader, and he's a staunch supporter of NIH and epilepsy research. And now I'd like to turn it over to Congressman Hoyer. I'm Congressman Steny Hoyer from Maryland's 5th District and the Majority Leader in the U.S. House of Representatives. Welcome to the American Epilepsy Society's 2021 annual meeting. My wife, Judy, lived with epilepsy, and I know firsthand the challenges faced by the families impacted by an epilepsy diagnosis. The AES annual meeting is so critical because it brings together epilepsy professionals in academia, clinical practice industry, 
and advocacy from across the United States and indeed around the world. And this gathering helps ensure that we keep moving forward so we can better understand, treat, and even cure epilepsy. I am inspired by the numbers of organizations like the Epilepsy Leadership Council represented here this year, a coalition of more than 50 professional societies, patient advocacy organizations, and governmental agencies whose members understand the value of collaboration in improving the lives of people with epilepsy. Before I introduce this year's renowned speaker for the Judith Hoyer keynote lecture in epilepsy, I would like to thank Dr. Walter Koroshetz for his leadership at the National Institutes of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. Drawing on Dr. Koroshetz's expertise and vision, NINDS is continuing to expand our understanding of epilepsy through its Centers Without Walls and its brain research through advancing innovative neurotechnologies initiative. Here in Congress, I am proud to continue working in support of funding for medical research, programs and services that support people with epilepsy and seizures. And that moves us closer to new treatment and cures. As the state of public health emergency for COVID-19 continues, my colleagues and I have worked hard in partnership with many of the organizations represented here today to ensure that those with epilepsy can access needed healthcare services through telehealth and can continue accessing their medications. We provided additional economic and social supports throughout this time of challenge. And we increased funding for the NIH, the FDA, the VA Epilepsy Centers of Excellence, and the CDC's epilepsy program and the bills we passed to address the pandemic. We were also successful in preventing the implementation of a policy that would have restricted access to anti-seizure medications in Medicare Part D. Now we're working to build back better by increasing funding for Medicaid home and community-based services, expanding coverage, bringing down the cost of prescription drugs, and making health care more affordable. It is leaders like our keynote speaker today, Dr. Paige Pinnell, who fill me with hope for the future. Dr. Pinnell is chair of the Department of Neurology at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine and Medical Center. She holds the Henry B. Higman Endowed Chair and is a distinguished and internationally recognized expert in the management of epilepsy during pregnancy. She's one of the lead investigators on the NIH-funded studies of maternal outcomes and neurodevelopmental effects of certain approaches to determining the extent of drug exposure of anti-seizure medications during pregnancy and breastfeeding. She also serves as President Emeritus of the American Epilepsy Society. In her lecture today, Dr. Pinnell will highlight the progress that has been made in reproductive rights and pregnancy outcomes for women with epilepsy. Judy would be so proud of the progress that has been made in the fight against epilepsy. She would be so proud as well of this annual lecture in her memory of the opportunity to bring so many stakeholders together to coordinate these efforts. I look forward to continuing to work with all of you as an advocate on Capitol Hill for research and new therapies. And I hope Dr. Pinnell's lecture and the connections you make with colleagues today will help energize your work in the months and years ahead. Thank you. Thank you for all that you do. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Paige Pinnell. Well, thank you, Senator Hoyer and Dr. Korshetz. Um, it's a real honor to be able to deliver the Hoyer Lecture. Um, I thought it was a good time to actually emphasize how much we have come, how far we have come in the contemporary care for women with epilepsy, but also to not stop there and how much further we need to go. These are my disclosures. Um, here are the learning objectives, which are also in your program. And so I actually want to start, as we know, we're all here 
because of the people we have the honor to treat, um, patients living with epilepsy. And with that, I'd like to invite Brandy Parker McFadden to the podium um, to share with us her thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for having me. Um, I wanted to tell you, start by telling you this. In 1984, I was a healthy nine-year-old little girl living in New Orleans, Louisiana. I had never heard of the word epilepsy or saw anyone have a seizure. My parents had not heard of a medication called Valproate. However, in the neurology field, there had been the first reported case of something called the fetal valproate syndrome. There was talk of how this anti-seizure medication called valproate could potentially harm women and their unborn babies. This wasn't a popular thing to discuss, much less research. Back in New Orleans, I was continuing my healthy, innocent life and going to school. I was dreaming of traveling the world when I grew up and maybe one day becoming a lawyer or a TV reporter like Diane Sawyer. I loved watching her on the show 60 Minutes. I would watch her thinking one day I could be just like her. I would pretend to be a broadcaster reporting the news and tap my papers on the desk just like the reporters on TV used to do. About seven years later, as a teenager, I had my first seizure and was diagnosed with epilepsy and then was given Valproate by my pediatric neurologist. The doctors told me to take my medication and my life would be normal and fine. That's not how my story ended. So Samuel was born uh, about three, four weeks early. He was sent to the NICU. He wasn't breathing well. So he spent about 10 days, I think, in the NICU. And then I thought I beat the odds. I brought this baby home from the NICU and he was breathing and he was finally eating. Little did I know that as Samuel started to grow up, he wasn't progressing. He didn't have the motor skills that he needed. I moved to Nashville, Tennessee when Samuel was two and a half and his pediatrician really pushed for him to have more testing. And then eventually, when Samuel was eight years old, he was diagnosed with being on the autism spectrum. Samuel, he's a gift from God. His perspective on the world is, if everyone had it, we wouldn't have the problems we have in the world. He makes you slow down and appreciate the things that God has given us. As I was researching the issues that Samuel was having with his language development, I started reading about different medications that people took when they were pregnant, and I saw that Valproate was actually an indicator for children with low verbal IQ, and I realized that I had taken Valproate throughout my entire pregnancy with Samuel. So here I was searching for answers for autism, and really it led me back to the fact that I have epilepsy, and epilepsy has dramatically impacted my life, even though I thought years ago that I was unaffected by my epilepsy. When I met Brandy, she had raised some concerns on the first visit regarding the potential effects of this medication on her pregnancies, her children, future children. In recent years, we've definitely seen more high quality studies and data pointing to uh, significant risks for uh, women taking uh, valproate and exposing the child in utero to valproate. During Brandy's pregnancy in 2003, that information was not available. There have been studies that came out in 2009 suggesting an association of lower IQ points in babies who were exposed in utero to this medication. I felt extremely guilty as I processed it and I realized that my anti-seizure medication caused this. I was just racked with guilt and felt horrible that something that had made my life seizure free and better had now made my son's life a lot worse. 
It's been really difficult at times to come to grips with where our story is. I've grappled daily with these emotions. I've asked why. I don't understand. How could this happen? It's taken a long time to really process those things, but I know there's a bigger picture. And I'm still not sure what that bigger picture is gonna look like, but I have hope that it's gonna be a beautiful picture in the end. One in 68 children will be diagnosed with autism. However, one in 26 people will be diagnosed with epilepsy in their lifetime. Half of those are women. What are we giving these females from the time that they're young to the time that they're older? Women are very different. We are made different and we have to address those needs. Brandy developed a My Epilepsy Story to help advocate, to help fund research, and to help educate people. And that is what our mission is. At My Epilepsy Story, we know that we cannot go back and change what happened to Samuel, but we do know that we want to push for more research, more awareness, better treatment options for women with epilepsy until we have a cure. I have been very privileged to watch Brandy build this thing. The sky is the limit for who she can help, not just in this country, but internationally. For me, epilepsy used to symbolize shattered dreams of what I thought my life was gonna be. Now I see that my epilepsy story is just one piece of a beautiful mosaic, showing the stories of every woman and girl living with epilepsy. Please join with us as we research, educate, and advocate for these women living in every corner of the world. It's a hard video to watch. Um, it was 10 years ago, this weekend, that I came to the American Epilepsy Society meeting as a patient hoping to find a neurologist that could help that little eight-year-old boy in that video. 10 years have passed. Samuel has grown up. He loves the swims team, trees, music, math, and his favorite is science. Albert Einstein is his favorite scientist. You see him right there planting a tree. He named it Einstein II. Samuel dreams of being a great scientist like Albert and working for NASA one day. Samuel has three good friends that support him and encourage him in everything he does. When Samuel is last in the swim team race, they all cheer for him to keep swimming, don't give up, and cross that finish line. They don't mind being the last team to finish the swim relay because they want their friend to be a part of the team, even when it means they will lose that relay race. That's teamwork and friendship that will change things in this world. Those three young men and these photos all went off to college this year. Well, my husband and I filled out disability paperwork for Samuel. As I filled out those forms, tears ran down my cheeks. Then the anger and guilt began to creep into my heart and soul. I won't lie to you, I have a love-hate relationship with pharmaceuticals. Their drugs keep me alive, but their drugs have harmed me, Samuel, and my family. My life isn't what that nine-year-old little girl thought it would be back in 1984. I ask myself and each of you, what has changed in the last year, 10 years, since I first came to this American Epilepsy Society meeting. What has changed since 1984? That was 37 years ago. I say not enough has changed. We desperately need government funding for women's health, and especially women's health and epilepsy. We need doctors, nurses, and pharmacists to be like that doctor back in 1984 and to report problems when they are seeing them and women and girls that they are caring for, even though it may not be the popular thing to report. We need researchers 
like Dr. Paige Pinnell and Dr. Kimford Mutter, as, we can, as well as countless others that have gone against the grain and stood up to create change. Yet they cannot continue to create change without larger and long-term federally funded grants for NIH to change the lives of these women and girls. I'm asking doctors and nurses to remember why you went into medicine. I'm asking everyone here and the ones watching across the country to see where we were and where we are now. This was preventable. If we would have just invested in women's health in 1984, Samuel would not be where he is today. Each of you has a mother, a female relative, and female friends. So women's health is important to all of us. As you listen to Dr. Paige Pennell's talk today, ask yourself, what will be your legacy? We don't have another 37 years to wait. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Brandy. I appreciate you very much sharing your story and inspiring us with your bravery. So um, some of the issues we face in epilepsy um, really result, uh, are very much related to a couple of things. Um, I do not need to tell the people in this room about the incredible stigma people with epilepsy have lived with, um, both sexes, genders. There's actually been anti-marriage laws for people with epilepsy um, were introduced in various countries over 200 years ago. And in some par parts of the world, epilepsy is still commonly viewed as a reason for annulling marriages or simply prohibiting them. Um, and uh, it's not just you know, uh, the low-income countries are underdeveloped. Even in the UK, a law prohibiting people with epilepsy to marry was only repealed in 1970. And in 1956, in the US, 17 states prohibited people with epilepsy to marry, and 18 states provided for eugenic sterilization of people with epilepsy. And it wasn't until 1980 that the last state um, repealed its law forbidding marriage in, in, um, for people with epilepsy. I want to just take a pause as we um, move into women's health issues and um, just give everyone um, sort of a playing field to remember when we talk about sex, it's actually biological classification encoded in our DNA throughout every cell in our body with either males having XY and females having XX. When we talk about gender, instead that's a socially constructed role, behaviors, expressions, and identities of girls, women, boys, men, and gender diverse people. I'm going to ask your patience today as I use the word woman. Um, what I'm really referring to is uh, people uh, with epilepsy who are able to bear children. So not all females recognize have the capacity to bear children for a variety of reasons, and not all individuals who have the capacity to bear children identify as women. And also not all individuals who have the capacity to bear children want to bear children. So just with that, I just want to acknowledge that I'm going to oversimplify the term as I move forward. So um, the, some of the problems we've had in epilepsy are really across all of science and across all of health. And in um, 1990, uh, the Women's Caucus, uh, which was uh, from the State House of Representatives, came, um, came together and actually pointed this out and eventually really fought hard to lead to the development of the Office of Research on Women's Health at the NIH. It was um, formed in response to congressional um, scientific and advocacy concerns that there was a lack of systemic and consistent inclusion of women in NIH-supported clinical research, which resulted in clinical decisions that were made about health care for women based solely on findings in men without any evidence that they were applicable to women. The Office of Research of Women's Health continues to this day to be a very strong um, part of NIH, but I will say that they do not have their separate um, budget line like many of the other institutes, and they work with the other institutes. What I have seen over time, and I can sit up here now at this uh, older age, to, um, with a long view of being able to see that there has been progress, even though we have a lot more progress to go. 
The thoughts when I was in training really used to be um, protecting women from research. We need to um, not uh, allow, obviously, um, it, we still have a lot of limitations of including uh, women who are pregnant in uh, many design trials. But even there was exclusion of women because they may become pregnant in many trials. And then also sex differences weren't looked for throughout research. But we're moving um, from protecting women from research to protecting women through research as we start to gain our knowledge. And in June of 2015, it led to a major change in NIH funding that um, consideration of sex as a biological variable had to be included in every NIH funded research proposal or an explanation given why it was not included. So this included both preclinical work as well as clinical research studies. And having, um, as many of you have, seen many proposals that come through, I can say that it is um, really considered a score-driving issue if sex as a biological variable is not included in research proposals now. So the Office of Research of Women's Health um, came up with a strategic plan for 2019 and 2023 so again, for all women um, with many different chronic diseases or new onset disease, the goal is that every woman receives evidence-based disease prevention and treatment tailored to her own needs, circumstances, and goals. And as we um, gain advances, we come closer to realizing this vision and better enabling clinicians to deliver individualized care appropriate for each woman's age and reproductive stage. This is not just about pregnancy. Pregnancy is a relatively few number of um, months of a person's life, but I am going to use it as an example, as it's one critical stage and is used as an example today, but how we can improve outcomes through research um, and um, provide better maternal and child outcomes. I also, I love this quote, um, if we think it's not important <laughs> to study uh, um, how we can keep women healthy during pregnancy or manage their chronic disease through, uh, during pregnancy, just take a uh, moment, and as Brandy said, every one of us has a mother, and also remember, pregnant women are responsible for giving birth to 100% of the next generation, and this should not be a sideline topic. So in 1997, the North American AED Pregnancy Registry was established at MGH, Harvard Medical School, by Lewis Holmes and his colleague Sonia Hernandez-Diaz, as well as uh, uh, on the advisory board or others such as Mark Yerby. And the reason um, why at that point there's no syst systematic method to evaluate whether specific anti-seizure medicines were associated with increased frequency of major congenital malformations. And let me just define that for a second for um, uh, various people in the audience. So major congenital malformation I might refer to as a birth defect, and it's something that would have a, an impact on the child's life, which would re either require major surgery result in a shorter lifespan or affect the child's uh, quality of life daily. So for instance, some examples are cleft lip, cleft palate, uh, spina bifida, uh, heart diseases, or problems with the kidneys. Um, then uh, uh, North American Pregnancy Registry continues today, um, but from the beginning, and it continues to be supported by pharmaceutical comp companies, but with data analyzed in a non-biased academic setting, and they have over uh, 13,000 women enrolled at this point. When I look back when I was in training, we were told, you know, just use phenobarbital. That's the first medication of choice for women who are pregnant because it's been around forever. We've had decades of experience. We know it's safe or it's safer. And then when the first AAN guidelines were written for treatment of women with epilepsy in 1998, um, it was actually stated to use the best anti-seizure medicine to treat that woman's seizures. And it was because we didn't have evidence at that time to provide any additional recommendations. And it was somewhat ironic that the first finding from the North American Pregnancy Registry was actually on phenobarbital. So in 2004, they published that the relative risk for a major malformation was 4.2 times higher compared to the background rate. And this is a summary courtesy of uh, Dr. Thompson. So compared to the first time the AAN uh, guideline was written, where are we now? And I can say we have made a lot of progress. 
So on the y-axis are the rate of malformations. And I want everyone to remember that in the general population, there is a chance that the child has a birth defect or malformation of around 1.5 to 3%. And our goal is to try to get the risk as low and as close to the general population as possible. Um, so we now have information from registries around the world, URAP, North American Pregnancy Registry, and the UK and Ireland Pregnancy Registry, that the rates are, are relatively low for these three medications, levetiracetam, lamotrigine, and oxcarbazepine. So we wanna look at the rates and we also wanna look at those bars for the confidence intervals of how sure we are about that data. In the middle at this point are topiramate, carbamazepine, phenytoin, phenobarbital, and over and over again across all registries, valproate has the highest rate of uh, risk for birth defects. So what's happened as this information has come out? Well, fortunately, we do see changes in prescribing patterns. So again, going to the North American Pregnancy Registry on the x-axis are the years, and bringing us up to contemporary times, you can see that there was a increase in the number of prescriptions for lamotrigine and an increase in the number for levetiracetam as information came out about the lower malformation rates. Meanwhile, the rates for valproate are in green, that they started higher and then came down quite um, significantly during that time. Um, on the right, you can see are the rates of malformations um, from this pregnancy registry at this point, but was displayed in the prior graph in a similar way. Um, so there have been changes in prescribing uh, practices as a result of the findings that we've been able to get through scientific um, studies. Now, URAP is a study led by Torbo and Thompson, but with a huge collaboration across 42 countries and several continents across the world. Um, this shows a similar thing. When you look at how prescribing practices changed over time, you can see that lamotrigine in orange became a higher and higher percentage of the medications prescribed, as well as, again, levetiracetam, and then valproic acid, the uh, percentage went down. And the other thing that uh, was really helpful to see as the prescribing practices changed, that they saw a drop in the rates of the birth defects from 6% down to 4.4% from 2010 to 2013. And I hope that when they are able to look at the data for 2020 to 2023, we hope that that, um, that percentage will get down around 2 to 3%. There's also been a concern, and there continues to be a concern, that if you change to these medications that are shown to be safer, women's seizures are going to get worse. And there's a lot of science behind that. I won't go into all of it. Um, but a lot of it was not realizing that you needed to adjust the medication during pregnancy to maintain a therapeutic uh, range or target for that person. But again, in the URAP study, that they were able to show that despite the change in the medications prescribed, that there was no indication of an increase in generalized tonic-clonic convulsive seizures during pregnancy. So it's very reassuring. It was really so we've talked about birth defects. But when we look historically, over time, we've realized it's not just about first trimester exposure. And thanks to the, um, the, really, uh, the work, really, that led this field by the likes of Kim Metter, um, also Gus Baker, Rebecca Bromley. Um, really, the realization came that we really need to consider about medication exposure throughout the entire pregnancy, because that same medicine that gets to the adult brain to control seizures gets across the placenta and gets to the child and the, child, the uh, developing brain of the fetus. And this is just a recent graph from um, the Monid study and uh, Angela Birnbaum's group that you can see that um, 1.0 would be, when you, we looked at the umbilical cord blood level at the time of birth, um, the blood level um, in the umbilical cord was about the same as mom's blood level. So 1.0 being the same ratio. So you can see across these medications, it is getting across the placenta and it is getting into the fetal circulation. And it's something that we need to consider. So um, with Kim Metter uh, designing the NEED study that was performed at 20, or several sites across the country and also in the UK, um, the first fi major finding that was released was on the um, children that were exposed to four medications during pregnancy and what the IQs were at the time of three-year-old testing. And you can see at that time um, already there was a strong signal that the IQ of children exposed to valproate was um, significantly lower than children exposed to carbamazepine, lamotrigine, or phenytoin in utero. 
Um, this was uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine in uh, 2009 and um, had a major impact, as you will see in a minute. Um, then the children were followed until age six, and um, this uh, pattern of lower uh, IQ and especially lower verbal scores continued when tested at the age of six with uh, Valpro 8 children having lower IQ. Um, in addition to that, um, work by Christensen and his group was really also helpful in um, further defining what the risk is and uh, specifically looking at autism and autism spectrum disorder, as you heard about from Brandy. And the uh, risk for valproate um, was significantly and substantially higher with valproate for childhood autism diagnosis and autism spectrum disorder um, compared to the general population and also compared to the other medications. So actually, um, valproate was already category D, which was for increased risks of those birth defects and uh, specifically, especially neural tube defects. But it was in 2011, after the first need finding, that FDA released a warning that children with prenatal exposure to valproate had an increased risk of lower cognitive test scores than children exposed to other anti-seizure medications. The first warning came out. And then with the subsequent findings, in 2013, they even um, strengthened the warning and made it a category X for women being treated with valproate for migraine headaches. So it's a very um, effective medicine for migraine headaches, which occurs very frequently in women of childbearing age. And as you can see, the category X is the risk of use in pregnancy clearly outweighs any possible benefit of the drug for migraine. However, for epilepsy and bipolar disorder, it has remained category D, that in certain women, the potential benefit of the drug um, may be acceptable despite its potential risk. But the recommendations are to try other medications before resorting to valproate um, for um, uh, prescriptions during pregnancy. So where are we now? So fast forwarding, you heard about the uh, most Monid study funded by the NIH, NINDS, and NICHD. So um, recently uh, published two-year-old cognitive outcomes in children of pregnant women in Modid. And the design of this study is we actually enrolled all women who came who were pregnant on any medication that they happened to be on. Now the majority, or um, a large proportion of them, were on Lamotrigine and Levetiracetam. So the good news is, at this point in time, looking at the children at two years old, that overall there was not any different from our healthy women. So we also enrolled healthy pregnant women and, and followed their children and did the same Bailey testing at age two years old. And overall, there were no differences. However, we are, we, um, are seeing a signal um, that with um, higher levels and doses of medications in the third trimester that there are some lower scores. And this was um, showed up in the motor domain on the Bailey scale, um, which is the second category over. Um, we have the three-year-old data, which is currently being evaluated, and I will say we're continuing to see the same um, finding, but now affecting verbal scores. So if you want to hear a lot more about it, on um, Saturday there's an investigator's workshop on the topic. Um, the other thing we um, wanted to do with Monid is look at several of the gaps in knowledge from the prior pregnancy guidelines. So I talked about the one back in the 1990s. Fast forward, we had another set of guidelines that came out in 2009, uh, a combination of American Epilepsy Society and AAN working together. And there were still, um, they felt like there was not enough evidence for several uh, different uh, uh, things that we need to know to take care of women with epilepsy during pregnancy. So one of the questions out there is, does pregnancy itself increase seizures? Um, and uh, the guidelines decided that because there was no control population, we could not tell if pregnancy was responsible or did increase seizures um, in women with epilepsy. So with that design, we were able to enroll a different control group, which is non-pregnant women with epilepsy, and we saw the same um, percentage of women who had increase in seizures. And by this, it was any increase in seizures. So it was very low bar. So if someone went from two seizures every three months, and then they went to 2.5 seizures on average uh, every three months, and then it was counted as an increase. So when controls were followed exactly the same way, we had the same findings that 23 to 25% of women had an increase in seizures, uh, two-thirds had no change in seizures, and about 11 to 14% had a decrease in seizures. 
However, the big difference between the two groups is that the pregnant women were, were managed with many more changes in dose and specifically dose increases over that period of time um, compared to the control women. So showing that if we have active treatment strategies with use of therapeutic drug monitoring during pregnancy, we can um, continue uh, to support seizure stability for women during pregnancy. Going back to the, um, one of the other questions is there's a lot of fear about breastfeeding because there's continued exposure and it's somewhat voluntary at that point in time as compared to pregnancy and could there be effects on the developing brain of the uh, newborn and young infant. So the NEAT study was able to look at this and actually showed that if women breastfed, those children, um, despite continued exposure to the medication, actually had improved IQ. So overall, um, for all ADs, a four-point higher IQ. And for valproate, there was also a significant gain if the women continued to breastfeed with a higher IQ of 12 points. Now, this was corrected for many important things, such as maternal IQ and other social demographic factors. Um, another thing that I think is, can be very helpful and encouraging is um, to discuss with women and their families that in breast milk, the uh, concentrations generally are lower, but more importantly, what are the concentrations in the breastfeeding child, the nursing child? So for Mo Monid, we were able to show that the concentrations in the child who was breastfeeding was much lower than in the woman. So um, this is like 30% for lamotrigine, but uh, others are even around 10%. Levetiracetam was particularly low. So compared to during pregnancy, the amount of medication exposure is quite a bit lower um, in the nursing ch child, and that's another piece of evidence to help support breastfeeding. Other studies um, have also shown, this is kind of a, a, um, a uh, busy slide, but just to let you know, so this, these are um, children who were breastfeed, breastfed and women on seizure medications, and if they were uh, breastfed is in the light, and um, uh, adverse out outcomes are more to the right, so in this group. So if they weren't breastfed, they had more adverse outcomes across these different domains um, compared to if they were breastfed. Th this is uh, polytherapy and this is lamotrigine. But again, the same, um, the same pattern is seen, that despite the woman being on medications, the benefits to the child's developing brain are still there. So um, I want to just talk about sort of the bigger picture. So, you know, these findings from Monid are really, you know, uh, many of it's very encouraging, but I really worry that women shouldn't have to come to a tertiary quaternary um, center to have this active management, to work with an obstetrician, and I, worry, I still worry about what's happening in the real world or even the real U.S. So 1-8 Foundation also um, has partnered in this concern, and so I can just show you this uh, is just uh, recently from a week or two weeks ago, some qualitative survey results. This will be followed up with quantitative results. Now, um, this doesn't mean that Dr. Dennis Spencer really was part of the survey, but you know it was such a good uh, photo, I had to include it, and also use it as another plug for this beautiful seahorse pin um, that we should all support. So just to take a minute, um, so this, these were, they interviewed many, uh, uh, interviewed many women of childbearing age and asked them what they felt when they think about um, prior to pregnancy, how do they feel when thinking about pregnancy? And these are some samples, these are 2021, how women still feel. Um, as you can see, you might lose your footing at any moment and this woman has decided to not have a child. Um, another one, considering a child, there's not a lot of sunshine there. It's kind of dim, dark forest. You want to go down the path, but you're not really quite sure what that you're going to find. Um, time's ticking. My seizures weren't under control in 20s, but now they're somewhat better, but time's ticking, and I need to get my epilepsy under control if I'm going to consider a child. Um, I felt kind of nervous, scared, and just kind of clinging on to something close to me. The wall is the epilepsy. It would just be something I would just have to work through, get through, figure out, plan for, and still come out on the other side. I just keep thinking a lot. I was thinking about what all of that meant. Genetic abnormalities like neural tube defects, passing along the epilepsy itself, just don't know what to do, whether to have a child. Another one who decided not to have a child, what else is hiding behind this curtain what else do I have to discover, what I don't know? 
The other thing, again, you know, I worry that people shouldn't have to come to a specialized center. And one of the things um, we all should think about and, and is a at the forefront of this meeting is what about underserved and rural areas, even in the US? So again, through this qualitative sur survey, they did uh, a primary care OBGYNs, um, found that uh, there was uh, more uh, concern about it. Many, many more women have unplanned pregnancies without the preconceptual counseling, which is so important to try to get them on some of the safer medications and get them on folic acid so they show up after um, conception without the preconceptional counseling that makes a big difference. Um, and also access to medication. So many areas where women are on dilantin in particular, phenytoin in particular, um, because of access to different medications. So then when they, um, uh, the qualitative survey looked at, um, they showed them some of the recent data that we've gone through, and they said, well, how do you feel? And um, many patients said they see the data as a big relief. Um, this is exciting to see. It gives people a little bit more hope. We can be reassured that you can live a lifestyle just like everybody else. And they're also eager to follow the recommendations such as uh, folic acid, considering um, this one woman was on topiramate and said that she realizes she may want to switch her medications before pregnancy. And also, even though it's, a, it's um, a lot of work to have medication levels monitored, it's worth it. And I just want to say, like, when you look at how women feel about the recent findings, remember that uh, we, we as scientists always think like, well, we have to have positive findings. We have to have statistically significant differences or we won't get published. But I want to remind everyone that negative findings can have a major positive impact. So some of the things like the seizure frequency not being different with active management, that this has a major positive impact on patients and their family and feeling okay that it is okay to start a family um, if that's what they choose to do. So kind of in summary, you know, this is where we are with medications. Um, if you look at sort of the ones we have a lot of information on um, for birth defects as well as neurodevelopment, and then we know that the one that has the highest risk is valproic acid, and these are in between. But I'll say the ones with the stars, we still don't know the neurodevelopment outcomes. We particularly have an interest in zonisamide because what happens if you fail levetiracetam because of an adverse behavior reaction or seizures and you're allergic to lamotrigine? We have to be able to still think of, have information on other medications in that particular situation, especially for a primary generalized epilepsy. But also remember, we, we, only have medi we only have information on nine medicines to put in these bubbles. So what about all the other medications to make up the total of 32? So uh, current research does allow us to begin to practice evidence-based counseling and care for women with epilepsy during reproductive years, but it took a long time to get the data, and then even longer to disseminate the findings. We need to try to avoid waiting for so many pregnancy exposures before discovering adverse fetal outcomes, such as what happened with valproate into Brandy's family. This is com compounded by the fact that there's no funded national registries for anti-seizure medications or adequate reporting structure for the birth defects, never mind any um, structure to allow for neurodevelopmental monitor monitoring or screening. And just for, um, to remind people, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's actually three times as many women who are on, in quote, anti-seizure medicine for other indications during pregnancy. So for instance, for bipolar disorder, for chronic pain, as we discussed, for migraine, and also for substance use disorders. Um, and we do have the, we need to make sure that our current findings at least reach other women with epilepsy in, in the US and worldwide. So we continue to have an urgent need to not only keep advancing the science, but to accelerate it. And with that, I thank you so much for your attention, and thank you again to Brandy for sharing your story. Thank you.